Good morning. It is very good to be here with you all today. It's been a long time since I've been, well, not anymore because I preached like an hour ago, but before that, it's a long time since I've preached. I'm excited to be here. We've been going through this Walk Like This series, talking about the fruit of the Spirit for several weeks now, uh, based on what Paul says to the churches in the region of Galatia. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, we can read, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit we're going to be focusing on today is faithfulness. When you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to show these fruits, these actions, these lifestyles to everyone around you. And if you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to have faithfulness. Being a believer, being a follower of Jesus, a man of roots of the Spirit to show out living inside of us. And that is evident according to what Paul says to these churches of Galatia that we read every week for the past several weeks by these fruits of the Spirit. When we accept Jesus, we, we set down that old life. We run away from it as fast and as hard as we can, running toward Jesus as fast and as hard as we can, and our lives are changed. Those changes are evident by the fruits of the Spirit. And if we have the fruits of the Spirit... We're going to have faithfulness. And if we have faithfulness, we're okay when God needs to break us to make us more like him. Let's have a prayer together, and then we'll get into the message. God, I thank you so much for today. Thank you that we can come together and study your word and worship together and just be with our church family. Be with us today as we look into your word and and find encouragement and help on how to be faithful. In his name I pray. Amen. Faithfulness seems like such an easy topic, right? We are all good Christian men and women, and and we would never struggle with living a life of faith, right? Of course, it's easy to be faithful to trust God, right? To provide for us, to protect us. We we know that we have faith that God has called us, and when he calls us, he's going to lead us and be with us. It's easy, right? Faithfulness is easy. But then life happens. I joined the Army when I was 17 years old. There was a, a program the Missouri National Guard had where you could go in do basic training between your junior and senior year of high school, finish high school out, and then go and finish training and be off on your military career. And I joined up in, in May of 1999, um, long time ago. The world was into basic training. They showed us that movie just to see who would cry. I didn't. But shortly after that, when I was 20 years old, uh, deployment was a regular word, and I got the opportunity to go, and I volunteered to go on a deployment to Bosnia, got attached to an infantry division, It was an exciting time. I was 20 years old. My job there on that base, that NATO base in Bosnia, was to be in charge of the chapel and all the religious needs of the U.S. soldiers and all the other nations that were on that base there. And that was the kind of the headquarters of NATO in that region of Bosnia. Faith was easy because at that point, things are going my way. Faithfulness is easy when life is good, right? Trusting in God to provide for us when we have what we want, not so difficult when we live safely, when we allow the lines of, of our, our faith in God he has us doing what we want to do, where we want to be, as long as we're led where we are comfortable, as long as we're led where we're familiar, it's easy to have faith, right? But is that really faithfulness? How, how faithful are we when the unexpected happens? How faithful are we when things don't go the way that we've had them planned out? How do we show our faith to the world when we get hurt? when we get lost, when we get broken. Well, that's when faithfulness is tough. You ever walk by a fruit tree when it's out of season? It looks just like every other tree, right? Maybe you're, you're super arborist and you know the leaves and the bark and everything, but if you go by a tree when it's in season, you know, well, shoot, that's an apple tree right there. Well, as followers of Jesus, live out a life of faithfulness when life is hard. How do we allow the fruits of the Spirit to be on display in our lives when we're hurting on the inside? If we have the fruits of the Spirit, we're going to have faithfulness. And if we have faithfulness, we're okay when God needs to break us to make us more like Him. I was just a few weeks from the end of that deployment to Bosnia. We had, it was a six months in-country deployment. We had a few months beforehand to train us to get us ready and uh, several weeks afterwards to, to get out of it. But a few weeks before I left country, I got a phone call. The unit I had been with before was being deployed to Iraq. And I had the opportunity to go with them. It was my option. They couldn't make me go that quick after getting home. It was going to be about two months after I got back from Bosnia. 
But I had the opportunity, and life was going great. I felt great. I had gotten promoted to go to Bosnia, so I was, I was getting awards, and you know, I was going to make... I figured I'd go to Iraq. I figured I'd go home for a little bit, have fun there, and then go, go to Iraq, maybe get some more awards, work hard, maybe get another promotion out of it, and continue to, to boost myself and make me a better soldier. Turns out that being proud of me and working toward my accomplishments and, and ribbons and awards to the Army wasn't really where my focus should have been. My pursuit of those awards wasn't the same as the pursuit of Jesus and the pursuit of sharing my faith. My life wasn't showing any fruits of the Spirit. I wasn't doing a good job of living for God because I was focused solely on myself. If we have the fruits of the Spirit, we're going to have faithfulness. And if we have faithfulness, we're okay when God needs to break us to make us more like Him. Fine, but hopefully something in your life can help my walk of faith as well. I don't have a five-step plan. I, it'd be great if I could get up here and have, here are five steps copy this down, check each one off every day, and you will have a great life. Your faith will be solid, and you'll be, you'll be set, no problems. I don't have a checklist like that, but we do have the Bible, and we can look and see what men and women in the Bible did and the lives that they lived, and we can learn how to be faithful. The Bible's a story from in the beginning God created all the way through to the amen at the end of Revelation. There are heroes in those stories. There are villains in those stories. There are victories in those stories, and there are sad defeats in those stories. Ultimately, the story of the Bible, though, is a story of how God loves his people and how he wants them to be with him. Amen. Well, those people in the story, God's people, now that's God's calling us to. He made a way for us not just to be good enough, but more than good enough through Jesus to spend eternity with him. And he expects us to be faithful. I'd like to briefly go through a few stories in the Bible that show these examples of faith, these stories that can show us what faithfulness really looks like. Maybe you remember the story of Joseph back in Genesis in the Old Testament. Joseph was the favorite child. How many of you were the favorite children? The rest of us hate you. I had two younger siblings that were the favorites. And I had an older sister. She's firstborn. She was kind of a favorite too. Then there was me. Joseph had a, a very colored tunic, according to the New American Standard Version. Maybe you remember it better in uh, Donny Osmond's version, the Technicolor Dreamcoat. That's an amazing Technicolor dream coat. And he got sent to prison. He rose up and became in charge of the prison, and God was with him. God was faithful. In Genesis 39, we can read, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the warden of the prison. And the warden of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The warden of the prison did not supervise anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made whatever he did prosper. God was faithful. Moses, standing before Pharaoh. You might remember Moses' story. He was put in the river in a basket with all the crocodiles and hippopotami, and he floated along, and God took care of him. Pharaoh's daughter pulled him out. He was raised in the palace. He was educated in the palace. He ran away, and now God's calling him to go back and stand before Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to release time and tell him to release all of his slaves because God said so. Moses was scared. He was worried he wouldn't have the right words to say, wouldn't know how to go about doing that. But God tells him in Exodus 4, 11, the Lord said to him, who has made the human mouth or who makes anyone unable to speak or deaf or able to see or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go and I myself will be with your mouth and instruct you in what you are to say. And again, God was faithful. Joshua had a great life, right? Most of his life he wandered through the desert until they were ready to cross the river and then the leader died. And Joshua is now called to lead. He's set apart to lead God's people across this, this river and, and, and to conquer this land full of people that Joshua was one of those 12 spies and they came back and 10 of them gave bad reports. Joshua was one of the two good reports with Caleb. But there were some giants in that land. They were scary guys and the, the 10 guys were like, hold on guys, let's just Let's just stay right here. This is good. But God called them to go across, and God called Joshua. And God said to Joshua in Joshua 1, 7, Moses, my servant, commanded you, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. And, and we've read the rest of the story, and Joshua led the people, and they conquered the lands, and God was faithful. Nehemiah was just the cupbearer to the king. He had a great life, a cushy life, a comfortable life. 
He got good food. He got good drink. He didn't really have to do much at all other than taste things that if it was going to kill the king, it'd kill him first. But life was good until the day that he heard that his homeland was in shambles. His people were in shambles. And God called him to go and take care of that. Nehemiah asked the king. He got permission. He got letters. He, he led the people to rebuild those walls. It was hard work. In Nehemiah 4.17, it says, Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their rebuild. You're not protected. You have no, no way to stop the enemies other than your hand when you see them with that sword, that spear. But they rebuilt the wall because God was with them and God is faithful. Daniel got thrown in the lion's den for praying. Have you ever spent the night in the lion's den? Nobody? Okay. Daniel did. And the lions stayed back, kept their mouths closed, and Daniel got out the next morning. His friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were going to get thrown in this fiery furnace because they would not bow down to any king other than God. They heated that furnace seven times hotter. They threw the three of them in there, and King Nebuchadnezzar looked and saw all four of them walking around, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and one who looked like the Son of Man. And God was with them, and God was faithful. Israel continued throughout their history when you look through the way everyone else was living. God called them back and led them back and pulled them closer to him, and they would lean back the way everyone else was living. But we aren't called to live like everyone else, are we? It wasn't long after I, I got into Iraq and I had gotten my tent all set up. Uh, deployments are really a contest of who can make friends with who and acquire what first. And I was lucky enough to acquire a wooden bed with a three-inch foam mattress. I was living, living the life. Uh, much better than those cots the Army has. But not long after I got there and got my tent set up, and I was, I was a chaplain assistant still. I was working in the chapel on base there, and I just felt really out of place, really off track. I had let go of a lot of the habits that I had once had. I did three semesters of Bible college before volunteering for the first deployment and then turned right around and went to this one. A lot of those good habits, those things we can do daily to help us live a good, faithful life, I had I'd stopped doing I carried it around because I worked in the chapel and I was supposed to. I really only prayed when I was supposed to pray in front of people for the chapel service, and I kind of set all those habits aside. I, I wasn't doing anything but focusing my life towards me. I wasn't doing much to serve God. I was just focused on me. And I, I remember one day asking a couple guys, we got together in the chapel and I asked them for prayer. I thought maybe if I could just go home for a little bit of time, I could reset. I knew there were people there that I could talk to, that I, I had history with, that could pray with me, that could be praying for me. And I needed that. I knew that that prayer is what I needed. And I remember sitting there in that, that wooden frame chapel with wooden uncomfortable benches in the chapel and I prayed with those couple guys that I just prayed that God would give me a break. Jesus comes along in the New Testament. He talks a lot about faith. He, he talks about, there's a story in Matthew 17. He gets on to the disciples a little bit about their littleness of faith. There was this demon-possessed boy. The father brought the boy to the disciples, and, and they couldn't cast it out. And so the father brought the boy to Jesus and said, Hey, your guys couldn't do anything. Can you do anything? Can you help my son out, please? Jesus heals the kid sends the demon away, takes care of the boy, and then turns to the disciples. And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, they couldn't drive it out. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and you say to this mountain, move from here to there, it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And once again, we see God is faithful. Jesus is faithful. And it's amazing if we can live a life of faith, what we can accomplish. In Matthew 8, chapter 10, there's a story of a centurion who comes along, and, and his servant was, was paralyzed and tormented, and he asked Jesus to help. And Jesus like, saddle up, boys, let's go. And the centurion stops him, says, I, I have authority. I have guys that obey me. You don't need to come. I know what authority you have. I know all you have to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus commends his faith in Matthew 8, chapter 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith in anyone in Israel. And this guy was not a Jew. He didn't have a faith like the disciples had. Mark 2.5, there's a paralytic. 
He couldn't get anywhere. His friends wanted to get in before Jesus, and they couldn't get in because of the crowds, but they knew Jesus was there. They went to whatever means necessary, whatever links they had to go to to get him in front of Jesus, to get Jesus in front of him. They, they carried him up on the roof, cut a hole, lowered him down. And in Mark 2, verse 5, Jesus seeing their faith, the faith of his friends, to go to whatever means necessary to put Jesus in front of their friend, said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Not only did Jesus heal that man, he got up and jumped and leaped and danced out of there, but Jesus forgave his sins. In Mark 4, verse 40, Jesus calms the seas. He had gone in to get a rest. They put the boat out on the water to have a little peace from the crowds around him. The storm got rocky and wavy. Remember the disciples, Peter and the boys, they grew up on the water. They knew how to handle a storm, so this must have been a doozy for them to come down and wake Jesus up scared, saying, hey, get up, man. Be awake. We're going to die because it's so stormy out here. And Jesus is upset with them. He calms the storm. With just a word, the winds and the waves stop. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And there's the story of Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. He was blind. He was begging and heard Jesus was walking by. And he started crying out, have mercy, have mercy. Jesus heard him and called him over. Bartimaeus jumps up and runs over to Jesus. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up, and answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him along the road. If we are faithful, because we know God is going to be faithful, then our lives will be changed. Just like God called his people in the Old Testament to be set apart, Paul reminds us in the first, that the first century church, and us included, need to also be set apart for him. In Romans chapter 10, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him who they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. <clears throat> However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ. We're called to be set apart. We're called to go and share that message, because if we don't share that message, how can they know, and how can they believe? Just a week or two after, I, I prayed for God just to give me a break. Uh, we went up, uh, the chaplain and I rode up with another convoy uh, to go see some of our soldiers who were training the Iraqi army a few hours north of, of our base so that the I Iraqi army could take over operations when we moved out. So we went and we did our thing with them. We held services for them and took care of them. And then on our way back, we're driving back in a convoy. And suddenly this civilian vehicle swerves in the middle of our convoy. Typically that means big boom and a lot of people get hurt. Well, in this case, there was no boom. Uh, I was in the middle vehicle of that convoy, back seat, driver's side. We were close to home, so I was relaxed. I had, you know, the full get up on, my rifle here, my feet hanging out the window, not far from base. I was chilling. And the first thing I remember was being outside the vehicle in the air, broken glass, freeze frame right here next to me, thinking, shoot, this is going to hurt. And the next thing I remember was hitting the ground, thinking, yep, that hurt. I rolled a little bit, slid on my back. We were going 55 miles an hour in the convoy, and I slid on my back until I came to a full stop. My uh, vest, we had the, the steel plate on the front and back of our vest, and I, I took that off. It was, it was really heavy at that point. I, I unsnapped the helmet and tossed it aside, had my rifle sitting next to me. I felt a little scraped up, but I sat myself up and looked and was like, huh, all right then. Sat up. Saw a little bit of, you know, blood. You slide on the asphalt at 55 miles an hour. You get some scrapes here and there. I went to stand up and realized, well, whenever I had gotten thrown out of the Humvee, I had actually gotten run over by the Humvee. And it turns out that my shin on my right leg didn't care for that so much. So my leg was broken, and I was just going to stay sitting on the ground for the time being. We got me all packed up and, and uh, back to base. And that next week, I spent time in where our base was near al Nazari, Iraq. Spent a night in Kuwait. Flew over, did a dip down in Baghdad, picked up some more guys, and then spent a few nights in Germany. Got put off on surgery. They just kept me with morphine and a temporary cast. I flew back across the ocean, stopped in D.C. because senators wanted pictures with wounded soldiers. 
uh, and then stopped at Scott Air Force Base for a night, which was nice because I got to go have dinner at TGI Fridays, the first real meal I'd had in months. And then went to Fort Sam Houston that Friday. Accident happened on Saturday, Friday afternoon, late rush hour traffic. I got my first ambulance ride. I wasn't really thrilled about it. Uh, but got to Fort Sam Houston, uh, Brooke Army Medical Center. They put me into the ER lobby from there, and right behind us, another ambulance pulled in. A guy had had an accident on a horse, and he got surgery, and they were going to send me across to a Ronald McDonald House type situation. And I'd been broken, literally, for a week and not very happy, hadn't really eaten much, hadn't done much, and I was a little bit irritable. And so I grabbed the first guy that came by wearing army pants and a hospital shirt, grabbed a hold of him and said, you've got to get me on the list for surgery. I'm not going across the street this weekend. He said, son, let go. So I let go of him. It turns out that man was the hospital commander, Colonel somebody. <laughs> Thankfully, he, he just ignored the fact that I had just grabbed a hold of him and told him what he was going to do. But he, he got me in for x-rays, came back and said, well, we'll get you surgery first thing in the morning. So first thing that Saturday morning, I went and had surgery. Everything went great. They put titanium in my leg, and I was on the road to recovery. That night, Saturday, they kept me medicated all day, but the nurse kept pushing the button. Uh, Saturday night into Sunday, I woke up. A, a man walked in the room. He was younger, uh, early 30s, looked like a runner, uh, wearing the, hospital, or the, the army pants and the hospital shirt. And he said, hey, I hear you wanted to talk to the chaplain. I hadn't asked for the chaplain, but that was kind of how this whole situation started, was I wanted to pray with somebody, so yes, please. So we talked for a little bit. We had a good conversation. Uh, he left me a few things, and in the morning, um, I went back to sleep, and in the morning, I got up, and the sun was up, and I knew what time it was, because I didn't know what time he came, because morphine does weird things to you in the middle of the night. And I asked the nurse if the chaplain could come back. I just wanted to thank him for taking time overnight to come and speak with me. So she goes and comes back a little bit later with uh, the chaplain, uh, but Santa Claus was following her in the room. He was a bigger guy with a big white beard, and I was like, no, 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 no. The other chaplain, the guy who came in last night. Well, it turns out this guy was the only chaplain on duty, and the nurse said she was at her nurse's station the next door down and across the hall, and no one came in the room nest that night, so I must have just dreamed it. But I, I still have the magnet that he left me. So it turns out that Sunday morning that I woke up and had the chaplain come speak to me what happened to be Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and so uh, my story is that Jesus likes to kind of walk through that uh, scenario again and, and get up on Easter Sunday and come see people. So he came to see me and left me that magnet. Well, I really, like, that hit. And I wanted to go to church. I didn't want to wait till I got home. I was ready. There was a, a church at the base floor of the hospital. I was going to go. Asked the nurse uh, what time service was. She told me but said I couldn't go because they didn't have enough staff to take me down in a wheelchair. And I hadn't been signed off on crutches by physical therapy yet. And my heart was just dropping. But as she said physical therapy, a guy walked by the door and, did you say physical therapy? The lead physical therapist for that hospital had left his Bible in his office and was coming to get it on his way to church that morning. So he stopped, looked at me, handed me crutches, had me walk down the hallway, signed a paper, handed it to me, took his Bible and left, and I was able to go to church. I, I don't remember anything about the church other than I, I sat, my leg hurt a lot, and I cried. Because God is faithful. Not long after that, I heard a story of how shepherds will sometimes, when a, a lamb starts to wander away and the shepherds worry the lamb's going to get lost or dead, they'll break the lamb's leg and carry it around for a little bit on their shoulders so that that lamb doesn't wander so far as to get hurt. So the lamb doesn't really get into danger. And after that lamb's leg heals, the lamb is so used to the shepherd. The lamb trusts the shepherd so much more, he stays at the shepherd's side more than any of the other sheep. I prayed for a break. God is faithful. We're in this series of walk like this, learning how to be full of God's spirit, learning what that looks like on the outside, learning what it looks like to be faithful. So how do we live a life of faithfulness that lives up to the standard that God sets with his faithfulness toward us? Well, we can look at stories of men like Joseph. It would have been easy for him to give up. He had a lot of bad stuff happen in his life. But he stayed true to what God called him, and God was faithful. Moses, he could have just stayed living in the palace and ignored when that Israelite guy got killed. He could have just stayed out in the desert when he ran away and, and had a family for himself and just blown everything off and stayed put. But he stayed true to what God called him, and God was faithful. Joshua, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that centurion, the paralytic, Bartimaeus, 
and countless other stories through the scriptures of men and women who stay true to what God's called them because God is faithful. If we have faithfulness, then we're okay when God needs to break us to make us more like him. And God will be faithful. We're going to sing another song. And as we sing that song, if maybe today is a day when, when you're feeling a little bit broken, or maybe you feel like you need to be broken and you need some prayer, I'll be back at the cross in the back of the room. I'd be more than happy to pray with you. Come join me. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus. You, you've heard your friends, your family, you've, you've lived a good life, but you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. And you hear these stories of the faithfulness of God, and you want more of that. And you want for the first time to accept him as your Savior and come forward and repent of your former life and set it down and run away from it toward Jesus and be baptized. We're ready for that today, too. Come on back. Talk to me. Let's see what we can do to encourage one another to live a life of faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you that you've given us the opportunity to, to be here, that you've given us the opportunity to uh, fix our mess-ups. God, that you've, you've made a way for us, and I pray you be with each one of us now. Help us to, to seek you with everything that we are, God, to try with everything you've given us to live a life that honors the sacrifice you made, to live a life of faithfulness, God. I thank you so much that we know we can trust you, we know that you are faithful and you'll be there with us. And I pray you can help us to see that and have strength from that. Thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.